exotic islands of mystery. Ooh, that must feel good. The gateway to exploring the wilds of East Africa. See what that guy just did? To Leviathan. Join me as I launch a great African adventure. We're down a muddy road without a tire iron. Zanzibar, the doorway to adventure. Habadi. Of course, that is hello in Swahili. Said, it's good? Yeah. And uh, our present course is taking us through the Indian Ocean as we pass through the waters of Zanzibar. Zanzibar is an archipelago filled with wildlife, some of it unique to these islands. But it is also the portal to the wild regions of East Africa. All right, let's get these sails up. Good job. So, for centuries, Zanzibar has had a reputation as the place to go. Now, many of the people who came to Zanzibar, to these exotic islands, had one thing on their mind, and that was trade. But there were others with different motivations. For example, people like Burton, Stanley, Speak, and Dr. Livingston. These men came not to trade spice, ivory, or tortoiseshell. They came for exploration. In fact, Zanzibar was often the launching point for these explorers as they made the way to the mainland of Africa. Hey, dear. And it's in the footsteps of those famous explorers that I intend to follow. We'll explore Zanzibar, then move on to the mainland of Africa. We're going to head up the mysterious Rafiji River until we reach a place called Salu, where I plan on showing you a predator that those explorers saw, but that few visitors today ever get a glimpse of. And it's not what you're thinking of. It's not leopard or lion, not cat, but canine. Uh, how about it, Kesh Kesh? Okay, so this is a plan. See that island over there? It's a protected wildlife sanctuary, approximately 50 acres. It's named Chumbe, and it's a wonderful place to see some very interesting animals. So, ready? Chumbe? Okay. Check this out. Hey, buddy. Ah! How's this for a crab? You gotta see this guy. In my hands is the largest land invertebrate. It's huge. This is the robber crab or the coconut crab, and it belongs to a super family of invertebrates called Pagyroidea. Just look how gorgeous it is. Look at those colors, almost chestnut red. It grows throughout its entire life. You're looking at it and you're saying, my gosh, it can't get any bigger. Well, it can. These animals reach three feet in length. Imagine a 40 pound coconut crab. Extraordinary creatures. In addition to coconuts, they'll eat fruit, they'll eat Animals, for example, a carrion, a dead mouse or rodent or lizard, what have you, will be eaten by this creature. So their diet is very diverse. In fact, the most important tool for this creature, these claws. This is the defense. See these claws? Powerful, powerful, powerful tools. But the combination of muscle and shell creates not only a great tool, but also an excellent form of defense and look, someone else is coming down here. Look who just crawled up on this log. Look at this. And you thought they only came in red. They come in blue or blackish blue. This is the most common color, the red face. But you do get this as well. Isn't that beautiful? An exceptional beast indeed. The giant of the invertebrates. There, very cool, the coconut crab. So, behind me, approximately nine kilometers away, is another island, a very exotic place, a place of spice, a place of adventure. It's the island of Zanzibar, 
and that's where we're heading next. But first, let's release these animals. Beautiful, beautiful crabs. Our next stop, Unguja, the main island of the Zanzibar archipelago. It's here where we will find one of the rarest monkeys on our planet. tree and the branches are quaking with monkeys. We are in the Jozani forest. These are some of the rarest monkeys in the world. There are a variety of colobus monkey species. You've got a variety of colobus throughout Africa, but here in Zanzibar is the only place where you get the red colobus monkey. Now we are on the outskirts of this forest and you would pass this forest and not even know that buried in its interior, hanging out in these almond trees, are these extraordinary primates. And today, there's less than 2,500. Hey there, lazy. Look at this. Look at this. Hey there, cutie. Hey there, look at this. This one? is a juvenile. And you can see that tawny reddish coat, that sort of thick pelage, thick coat of fur unique to the colobus monkeys and in the species here in Zanzibar, which has been isolated from the mainland for 15, 20,000 years, is very different in appearance. Where are you going? Look at this, look at this. Look at this guy. This is great. We're actually seeing this animal give us a demonstration of its eating behavior. What's unique about all the uh, colobus monkeys is that they've got a four-chambered stomach, as with cattle, okay, they're ruminants. By having these diverse chambers, they can really be efficient when it comes to digesting the leaves that they eat. Here we go. Look at that. Got a niche there, but um, really cute faces, don't you think? <laughs> Beautiful red colobus monkey. It looks as though it has not a worry in the world. And although um, it is a critically endangered species, numbers sort of hovering not far from extinction, the future is starting to look a little brighter for these animals. True, there's still the problem of habitat loss in Zanzibar, but today, at least the people of Zanzibar have recognized that these animals need to be a part of Zanzibar's future. The red colobus monkey. Coming up next in the experience, they're the island's oldest residents and the heaviest. Ooh, that must feel good. And later, I'll introduce you to some very large creatures that you would not want to go swimming with. And a pack of predators that you won't want to be left alone with. For centuries, Zanzibar has been the international hub in this part of the world for trade. People have come here from Africa, from the Middle East, from India, all coming with one thing on their mind, and that is trade. And one of the best places to do that is Stonetown. You know, if you're a street cat here in Zanzibar, this is definitely the place to be, the fish market. 
But this is sardine yeah. with salt. Yeah. Saucy. Saucy, right. right. Let's leave this city and head into some more wild habitat. You know, one of the great things about Zanzibar is that you're never really far from the jungle. Be very quiet. Now, I'm not going to capture this creature, but I wonder if I can sneak up a little bit. Look at this creature. You can perhaps detect that, um, oh, oh, ants everywhere, ants everywhere. Oh, okay, that's not gonna work. I know what you're thinking. Why are we climbing a tree for a guinea pig? Well, that's what's interesting about this creature. It's not a rodent at all. But to tell you more about it, I wanna kinda coax him down. Let me see what happens if I get down. Climb down. Climb down, buddy. See how he jumped for, to that branch? See this, he's looking right at us. But in case you're thinking I'm a wuss about climbing this tree and dealing with the ants, see this? It's a big snarl of leaves and, and a bit of webbing. These are weaver ants. They can give you a nasty wallop. And I could feel them just sort of crawling all over me and I just, frankly, didn't want to deal with it. But I think I can sort of pull myself up a wee bit so I can highlight this creature, which is pretty cool. Okay, this animal right here, an amazing creature. In fact, when you look at it, you think rodent. But this animal shares no ancestry to rodents. Believe it or not, its closest relative is an elephant. Okay, Proboscidae, the elephant group. This is a hyrax. You can perhaps detect that, um, ooh, that this animal has those teeth sticking out. Those tusk-like teeth are not only used for pruning vegetation that this animal browses on. Okay, it's an herbivore, vegetarian but it's also used in defense and combat when these animals are in the breeding season. Now, what I wish I could do is hold this animal. I can't because if I do, there's an excellent chance he'll take one of those two inch long teeth and run it right through my thumb, and that would not be good. Now, these are not a creature that have a very long lifespan. 10 years is a very elderly hyrax, but they have a very long pregnancy that's almost as long as a human pregnancy. We're talking, you know, eight, eight and a half months because the ancestors of this animal weren't guinea pig-sized creatures weighing four or five pounds. They were oxen-sized animals weighing many hundreds of pounds. But for some reason, that long pregnancy has passed from generation to generation even with the more minute example of the ancestors of these hyraxes living millions of years ago. You know what? My arm is falling asleep, so I'm getting out of this tree. And whew, we can continue our journey through amazing Zanzibar. Look at this, this compound, electrified padlocks. It's all about protecting the contents of this paddock. Hey, Dennis. Ah, hi, Jeff. How you doing? Okay. Careful. This is Dennis Doughty, and Dennis is a veterinarian. And good to see you. Oh, yeah. And uh, this is what he keeps. This is his specialty. Now, these are Aldabra tortoise, the giant tortoise which you find living in the Seychelles Islands. But there's a population living here. Ooh, that must feel good. Uh, 
It's okay. <laughs> it's been worse. <laughs> That's a problem when you weigh hundreds of pounds and you land on a human's foot. It's a little painful. And in fact, these tortoises, the Aldabra tortoise, are rivaled in size only by the Galapagos tortoise. But these creatures have what are called elephantine legs, large column-like legs that spread out in surface area as they head down to the ground because essentially this creature is built like the Parthenon, a lot of weight. And to support that weight, you need column-like legs. They really like this, don't they? Yeah. They just love to be scratched. Because I can't figure, there's got to be no way they can actually scratch it's there. It's got to just feel awesome. Look at that. And you can see this creature just really is having a nice time. It's actually resting its head in my hand. And it's, uh, this is pretty special to get this close to such a rare creature like this. Now, how do you keep track of these animals? Well, originally we started with numbering them, but that doesn't work yeah. very well because they get rubbed off very quickly. Right. So now we are microchipping them. Oh, so like pit tagging. Yeah, awesome. right. right. So all the adults have been done, and as they get old enough, we do the juveniles. Yeah. As a matter of fact, if you want to take a look, I'm going to do one right now. Right now? You're going to take Yeah. All right, no. let's go check it out. Get to see a younger tortoise. Now here's a little guy, young Aldabra tortoise, which is what, maybe two years? Yeah, maybe two yeah. years, one and a half, yeah. one, yeah. yeah. It's still pretty small, still pretty delicate, but the, the secret is, is to protect this animal in that if someone should steal it, you'd want to be able to track it down. Right. Now, this is an avid scanner right here, and what we're gonna do is put a microchip in this animal's body, so eventually, whew, with one wave of this electric wand, you'll have a reading. So you have a pit tag ready yeah, to go? Yeah, right, I got one set in the okay. syringe here, right. Of course, you know, you wouldn't want to expose this animal to any infection, so we have a little rubbing alcohol to clean the entry site. It's just gonna go barely into this creature's flesh. And where do you want to do it? I want to do it on the Right on the other side, side here, which is yeah, a little right. more fleshy? Yeah. Okay. He's being pretty brave. Yep. Ah. And you have to try to get it between the scales, yep. which is not always the easiest right. thing to do. There you go. There now that's going to be in there. Dynamite. And that's it. So now we can see if this works. So we've got our scanner here looking. Uh-huh. Hear that? When you hear that beep beep, and it says 11491224A. That is the new ID of this tortoise. All right, there you go. Hold on to that I number, got I gotta number. record it. Okay. Yeah. Ali Nipe. And this is what this it's is like Ali. when life begins for one of these creatures. Look how tiny that is. What a precious little thing. And the creature like this, so tiny at this age, hatching from an egg, not much larger than a ping pong ball. And this is the age when a tortoise is vulnerable. Hermit crabs, birds, all sorts of creatures will eat them. Right? right, that's a real problem. So yeah. it's good that they're being protected. Well, thanks a lot, Dennis. Okay. I appreciate Asante. the time. <laughs> Asante, don't drop that okay, valuable tell resource. Her. All right, yeah, let's I go. Know. Coming up next in the experience, a whole herd of giants will demonstrate their skills at synchronized swimming in the nude. After crossing the Straits of Zanzibar, we're now going to venture onto the mainland of Africa, heading up the Rafiji River. We'll explore an area called the Salu. All right, we've got to stay alert because there are many obstacles looming in this waterway. Some of them, believe it or not, have tusks. As you can see, I've traded in my dial for this hardy vessel. It's called the pontoon. We have left the heavily navigated waters of Zanzibar for some seriously uncharted territory. This is the Rafiji River. Our goal is to get to a place called Salu. Right now, we're in a situation where we just have to keep our wits about ourselves, go slowly and calmly, because we are surrounded by 
40 or 50 hippopotamuses here. These are huge creatures, weighing up to 10,000 pounds each. Look at the size of these animals. So we're just gonna carefully just drift our way past these hippos. Huge. The word hippopotamus refers to water horse, but in fact, these creatures are nothing like horses. They're herbivores, okay, like horses. They're eating plant matter, about 100 pounds a day. But in fact, these hippopotamuses are more closely related to pigs. Shh. We're going over something. I just felt something bump the bottom of the boat. There it is. See that? That was close. I was actually nervous. I was thinking that maybe one of these animals could come up and hit our boat. That's, a, that's an occurrence that does take place here. In fact, on this river, not even a month ago, four people were killed, not by crocodile, but by a hippo. A hippo had overturned their boat, and they were unable to swim. And then the crocodiles came in and finished the job. But even crocodiles are afraid of hippos because there are stories of large bull hippos snapping crocodiles in half. See what that guy just did? They're leviathans, massive beasts, but practically invisible when they're under the water. Hear that sound? That's most likely a male, a bull, sounding off. We think of them also as being quiet creatures, but in fact, hippos are extremely vocal. Their calls can be heard for a mile or more along a river like this. And they have ways of identifying themselves. Like, you know, the call. That sound. You know, it's a really interesting thing to see is to witness one of these hippos moving underwater because they gallop underwater. They submerge till they hit the muddy bottom and then they boop, 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 just gallop across. A creature three times as big as a Volkswagen bug just hovering underneath the water. And the only thing you see when they move underwater is just a trail of bubbles. Cool stuff. All right, so here's the plan. Let's continue to meander down this river. Let's try not to hit any hippos and explore this amazing ecosystem, just like explorers have done more than a century ago. When the experience continues, we're confronted by a thorny problem. You gotta be kidding me, look at this. With fangs and it packs a nasty bite. Then, our expedition suffers a small setback. We're down a muddy road without a tire iron. This is some dense jungle, very much a, an Africa I'm not familiar with, but I think this is the trail I'm supposed to take, clearly used by hippos. Yep, there we go. Habari, you must be Ranger Peter Lusai, I presume. Yes. Hi. Hi. I'm Jeff Corwin. Okay. And you are? Mohammed Haule. Hi, Mohammed. Uh, so this is what we'll be moving in? Yes. Through the Sulu? Yeah. All right. Well, our expedition has changed from the water to the land. And coming up next, we're going to see what this landscape has to offer. All right. Okay. I'll follow you. Impala, very important source of food for the creature we're looking for, painted dog.
Look at this. See how dense the vegetation is? It's almost jungle-like. Very different from other parts of Africa that I've explored. It doesn't have that Serengeti feel, that vast sweeping sea of savanna or grass. And I can see we are gonna have a challenge to find that uh, painted dog. But to assist us, flying overhead, I've got a spotter plane. And if Mark sees something, he'll radio us and we'll move in. But we've got a lot of territory to cover. It's morning, and already it's about 80 degrees, and I think once that sun breaks through the clouds, we're gonna fry. Wow. Can you stop? Stop right here. Asante, Asante Sana. You can just kill the engine. Just give me like, give me like five minutes. I'm gonna go check this out. I love how green this place is. A color you only see when the rains come. During the dry season, this place is brown. See this acacia tree? An excellent example of symbiosis. This is the Trepenolonium acacia and uh, living across the branches and the leaves of this acacia tree are ants. See that ant? He's just running all over this gall. He wants me away. He's ready to put his life in the line to give me a nasty wallop on my finger or to give a, a giraffe a nasty wallop on the tip of its lip. And when these ants bite you, they squirt formic acid into the wound, making it very painful. Speaking of nasty wallop, you gotta be kidding me. Look at this. Look at you. Beautiful snake. Let me pull it out in the open. An excellent example of the viper family. Members of the viper family to be found in Africa. And this is the puff adder. So many things I could tell you about this creature that just make it very special and very unique. One thing you can notice is the way it moves. It has the ability to move in a straight line. Basically, the muscles move forward, pulling the scales up behind, those muscles rolling forward, and the scales create traction and pull this creature to safety. The eyesight of this animal at this point in its life is not very good. That is because it is an opaque cycle. It is getting ready to shed its skin and it produces sort of a lubricant beneath the skin that gives it this blue hue. And what you can see is that underneath the lens of its eye, it's all cloudy and milky and blue. And eventually, it'll perform ectysis. It will shed, it will exfoliate and look brand new, look all fresh and shiny. Now, if you should be so unfortunate as to step upon this snake, it will defend itself and it packs a nasty bite it's got goodly sized fangs. It produces a very painful hemotoxin, flesh degrading venom. But if the person who is bit by the puff adder seeks out medical attention immediately, most likely they'll recover. This is our lucky day. Look at this. Look at this. Look at this. Look who's coming out. Come on. See, it would rather. Come here, you. Look at this. Another puff adder, but this one is a juvenile. This one's a bit younger, a bit more sparky in temperament. Now this one is a male. You can see it has a longer tail, which tells us that it is a male. This one, see how short that tail is? That small tail means female. Longer tail means male. Maybe we've stumbled on a little, uh, a little savanna love, a little amore. We'll let him go, and he'll return right back to the original spot. Good stuff. Coming up next in the experience, we'll explore an ancient tree of life. Talk about a big tree, it's huge. Then later, we'll see some of Africa's most skilled predators. They're called painted dogs, but you know what? They're nothing like your friendly dog, Spock. Hey, down, boy. Look at this. Holy cow. 
Talk about a big tree. It's huge. It's huge. This is a baobab. Baobabs are, are an ancient species of emergent. And this is the largest tree, certainly the largest baobab I have ever seen. A tree like this could be a millennium or more in age. Look at this right here. We've got some remnants of a bird's nest, but what we have here are gecko eggs. This gecko is an arboreal species. What they normally do is they lay their eggs on trees and the eggs come out rubbery, pliable, but sticky. And they stick to the surface where they're laid. That way they're out of reach for predation. But in the case of this batch, didn't work. They were knocked out. Where did they fall from? Oh, right there. See? Right there. Look up there. OK, and this is what happened. You had this nest. This nest was adhered, cemented to the tree with that mud. What I believe happened is some sort of predator marauded, invaded that nest. Maybe a snake, most likely a genet or civet. It got what it wanted. It got the hatchlings, it got the eggs, maybe even a nesting parent. And then the byproduct of its behavior, it knocked out these eggs. Didn't even eat them, didn't care about them, was going after this and nearly destroyed this gecko nest. But I think we can salvage it. So let's go check out this tree and look for a cavity where we can dump these eggs. Can you imagine being a kid and having this in your backyard? Sure, guys, come on over and play at my house. My mom said she'd make lemonade and little cookies, and then we can eat them up there. But you'll need to bring an oxygen tank, because the uh, altitude. Got a bit of rib cage here. How does that get all the way up this tree? A leopard. A leopard grabbed itself some prey, consumed it up here perhaps three, ten years ago, and its remains trickle down from this tree into the root system beneath us. So, there you go, guys. The rest is up to Mother Nature and luck. But we cannot leave this extraordinary ancient baobab tree without doing some serious exploration. Holy, holy cow. Look at this. You won't believe what is hiding behind this root. Holy moly, look at this. This is an African lamb snail. And it's huge. It's gigantic. It weighs about a half a pound. And it's just sliming its way across the surface. Massive, massive snail. Oh, oh, now he's coming out. Look at this. He's coming out to see what's going on there. See what he does. Oh, here comes an eye stalk. Other eye stalk. Look at this guy. Look at that as he comes out. Looks like something you'd see in, in Men in Black. You can see the flesh underneath its skin undulating, the muscles quivering, and you can actually see blood flow. Really neat, neat mollusk. You don't need to go to foreign planets to find aliens. They're living amongst us. Land snail. Isn't that a cool creature? I mean, look at the size of that shell. Now, I just saw something trail its way down this strangler fig extension, so I'm coming down to you and we'll check it out. Here it is. But look at this guy right here. Isn't that neat? This is a forest millipede. And it looks 
a bit menacing, but it's harmless, and he moves across a sea of hundreds and hundreds of undulating legs. See how they move ocean-like in a way, the legs, the way those muscles are designed to move in unison. It's like a current. I love the way that moves like that. All right, let me place him right there. All right, let's continue to look around this great old baobab. Of course, I can't leave this ancient baobab without checking out this. There's a cavity here. Perhaps it began as a derelict termite nest, which rotted away five or 600 years ago, leaving a cave, a tree with a cave. And a cave, of course, which has become habitat for, see that, bats. We've got one, two, three, four bats in here. And uh, I'm kicking myself because I'm a bat biologist and I didn't bring a mist net or not even a butterfly net. But just from looking at them, I see they have big ears, big ears, small bodies. So they're most likely members of the microchiropterans. Okay, you have megachiropterans, the fruit bats, and microchiropterans, small-bodied bats, although some get kind of big. Very much dependent on echolocation, producing a high-frequency sound wave to track their food. And in the case of these animals, their food is most likely insects. So you can see this tree comes together to create almost a, a micro-ecosystem. And when you have an organism in an ecosystem like this, where so many creatures come together in unison, dependent upon the singular organism for survival, that organism is a keystone species. It is a stepping stone of survival for many creatures, everything from invertebrates, like snails and millipedes, to vertebrates like geckos and bats, and even the bigger stuff, the predators, like leopard taking its terrestrial meal up into the treetops. That was a pretty cool tree. I saw what I think were some bones from a leopard, like the scapula, some rib. Uh-huh. Okay. This is Jeff, over. Wild dogs, you know how many? Uh, we're looking at about 10 over. All right, thanks a lot. Good news to hear. Good news. All right, here you go, Holly. All right, stand by. Oh my gosh. All right, here we go. Fingers crossed. Let's see what happens. Do you hear that? Yep. Said wild dogs? I know what you're thinking. Is it worth it? We've come all this way, across the Indian Ocean, up rivers, through savanna and forest, trying to weave around hippos, a, a searing sun, all for the painted dog. Yes, it is worth it. We can't let this little, little bump in our journey hold us back. It's all part of the adventure. This is the price you pay when you're in Sulu exploring during the wet season. You gotta deal with a lot of mud. We are 40 kilometers from our camp, so if we don't free this vehicle up, we're down a muddy road without a tire iron. 
Well, this is it. We're hours from camp, and we're bone dry. All the water's gone. And if we don't find that painted dog soon, game over, expedition done. <laughs> we're saved. Coming up next in the experience, I think I've been out in the sun too long. Yep, looks like heat stroke to me. Our search is now in its eighth hour, but finally things are starting to look up. Following the directions from our spotter plane, we're getting very close to a good sized pack of very rare painted dogs. Now we should be able to get pretty close because these animals are taking shelter from the intense African sun. This is perfect, excellent. This is our whole reason for coming to Salu, because behind me, laying lazily in the shade, escaping the sun, is the rarest predatory mammal in this part of the world, and the second rarest predatory mammal in Africa. The number one rarest, the Ethiopian wolf. The second, this creature right here, the painted dog. Formerly, they were known as cape hunting dog or wild dog. The reason why there's a lot of push by the conservation community to recognize these animals as the painted dog, because the other titles tend to further fire the persecution of these animals, okay? Wild tends to bring up uh, words uh, like feral. But these animals are not feral. They are their own unique species. Hear that sound? That's a tweetering sound. Now, when these animals are upon a kill or when a pack unites after being out in the field hunting, you'll get a lot of that <laughs> high-pitched tweetering sound. It builds the bonds. It shows where each, each dog fits within its pack. You also have a... a, a See how they're more alert? That's a call that is a long distance call, if you will. When a pack is separated, they're moving through the bush, they're not visible to each other. They'll howl like that, almost wolf-like, to establish location. They truly survive as a social unit, as a social group. For example, they will track a potential antelope they want to eat for hours moving along at a slow trot for many miles until the animal is exhausted and then they move in there's no fighting there's no squabbling they eat together they're excited they share the meal but then one will be selected from the group to gorge to fill its belly up with food but not for itself it then will return to a den site to then regurgitate that food to offspring to pups that's amazing well, it was a great journey. We traveled from island, across sea, and upriver into the Salu, following on the coattails and shadows of the great explorers. And to be a part of that experience has been a great journey for me. But unfortunately for you, your journey has ended because I'm going to continue my exploration of Africa until we meet again on the Jeff Crowen Experience. All right, let's go.